Welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. It is such an honor to have my guest today, Stephen Wright. I talked to him last week. I read his book. And it's just, I think I talked to yeah, I talked about it last week. It's amazing. Highly recommend it. And we'll, t- we'll get into that with him. But he's been on the show once or twice before. One of my heroes. Truly one of the greatest stand-up comics. We'll, t- we'll, we'll give him an intro later. Anyway, uh, let's talk about today. This is going to be quick. A quick one, because I've got to run to go interview Kyle Kinane for a future podcast. Um, It was Mother's Day weekend, which was very nice. Gave my wife the usual treatment. She got breakfast in bed with the whole family. A little center for a massage. Went for a long walk on the beach. Uh, Went to a movie, dinner. Threw a move on her at the end of the night. Shut down. Hey, it's Mother's Day. Your call. It's what you want. It's not what I want. Father's Day? Oh, that's going to be a very different story next month. Uh, But we went to see a movie with my son and daughter, and they wanted to see Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, based on the Judy Bloom book. And, okay, so we walk into the theater. It's about... uh, 4.30 showing and it's filled with teen girls and then one gentleman comes in who um, looks like he's been on America's Most Wanted several times. He's got on a jean jacket with oil on it. His hair is slicked forward though thinning and he sits directly in front of me and my wife and the seats around him fill. He's alone. And then the seats around him fill up with teenage girls. And my pedo alert goes sky high. I'm like, what the fuck is this guy doing at a teenage girl movie? It was so weird. And so all these girls are sitting next to him. And the movie was fantastic, but I didn't pay attention to it because I kept leaning forward to peer over his shoulder that he was not touching himself. My wife also noticed him without us even talking about it. She told me after the movie, she was looking at the armrest next to him the entire time to make sure his hand wasn't going anywhere. It was that creepy. It was insane. And meanwhile, the movie, he's watching the movie and like opening scene Two 12-year-old girls in bikinis jumping back and forth between a sprinkler. One of them uh, strips down naked. You don't see any nudity, but it's it's she's stri- this would be high eroticism for a pedophile. She strips down to nothing while the other girl watches. Um, the whole movie is them trying on training bras. There's... Um, spin the bottle and two minutes in the closet together and all those games. And then, and then the girl putting, uh, tampons in her underwear or whatever they call them, maxi pads. It was a pedo's delight. And I'm sure in the chat rooms, they are all telling each other to go see this movie. Oh my God. So creepy. So, uh, we did that. Um, I big did a big thing this weekend. I directed my first stand-up special. I don't know if you listened to the podcast last week, but Zane Lamprey was on the show. A uh, very funny comedian who asked me, is actually he asked me to do his last special, and I said no. I didn't feel ready. I've said no to a few people. Um, Bert Kreischer asked me once to direct one of his specials, and I said no. And now I feel like I'm ready. Uh, I just directed my own special, and I got a lot of advice from some of the best directors around. And so I decided to do it. And I was nervous. I probably overprepared, and Zane had a lot of faith in me, and we worked together on his set, you know, leading up to it. And we got we loaded in the night before and blocked it out and then spent the day working on the lighting and the set design and... Uh, he was great. He showed up. What a pro. We got good crowds. We had amazing crew. This guy, Ian, was on the, uh, the he was a cinematographer, the, the uh, DP, and he was great. The lighting guy was amazing. I think his name was Ziad. Um, 
everybody, the audience crew, seating people, um, crazy. We had on the first, we did two shows. First show, uh, pe- believe it or not, the early show was the crazy one where people were shit faced. Like I think they all went to brunch and started drinking, and we did a show at like four o'clock, and people were thrown out. A fight broke out out front. Where this guy, I went out there to see what the fuck was going on and try to calm it down. And this guy like threw his, threw his wife or his girlfriend down into a chair and screaming and um, it was nuts. But then the second show was like perfect, great crowd. He totally nailed it. He did like an hour and a half. We only need an hour. And so we got a lot to work with. And, uh, and he was really happy with me. And it really feels like this is something I, I love doing. And this is something I want to pursue. I want to direct specials. Uh, I think I've got a good background as a comedian and, you know, as a TV writer and a producer. I've been behind the cameras enough that I know what, what, what to look for. So anyway, yeah, big, big career news. That's going to be my new career because I'm not hybrid enough. I need more things to do. Um I was that was down in Huntington Beach, and the night before, I did a show in Huntington Beach. Here's the thing about Huntington Beach: nice people, but the dudes are dudes. It's a surf town, and it's a lot of dudes who like drive pickup trucks with you know four wheels in the back, and they're oversized. And the guys have wraparound sunglasses and the old school '90s goatee, and they're always a little bit sunburnt, and they shake your hand a little too hard. That's the vibe. And the women that love them, no matter what they do, they fucking love them. So that was the that was the vibe. I did that show and that was fun as hell. Uh, what else? I don't want to waste a lot of time. I want to get right into Stephen Wright. But I want to say um, hi to uh, we'll do these overheards later. Let's do the overheards later. Let's get right to it. Um, before we do that, I want to remind you guys, I'm doing stand-up comedy in Columbia, Missouri this weekend at the Blue Note, May 19th, the following night, May 20th at the Argosy Casino in Kansas City, Austin, the mothership, Joe Rogan's club, I believe is already sold out May 25th through 27th, Laugh Boston, some tickets available June 16th and 17th, then I'm coming to Potsdown, PA. July 20th, and then Point Pleasant, Uncle Vinny's, July 22nd and 23rd. Something like that. Check the website for details. Fitzdog.com for all your tickets. Also want to tell you about my good friends over at Factor. Look, with Factor, if you don't have time to cook, we all work too hard. The pandemic's over. We're back to it. Skip the grocery store. Skip the chopping, the prepping, the cleaning up. This stuff... Factor is so fresh. You don't even put it in the freezer. It goes right in the fridge. It takes two minutes to heat up. And I'm telling you, five, less than 550 calories for the diet approved calorie smart meals. Uh, they've got keto. They've got vegan, veggie. I got the protein plus for my mom. My mom has lost a lot of weight since her heart surgery. And I got her on Factor. For the new year. And uh, they've been sending her meals. Protein Plus. She's put on seven pounds. I thank you uh, for that factor. Helping out my mom. And by the way, all of this, cheaper than takeout. So, you are you know, it's faster and cheaper than takeout. So just, what, what are you, why are you still even listening to this podcast? Get on it right now. It's Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. And, uh, and I know you're going to love them. Right now, head to factormeals.com slash papers50 and use code papers50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code papers50 at factormeals.com slash papers50 to get 50% off your first box. All right, let's get to it. Stephen Wright, what can you say about this guy? He was ranked as the 15th greatest comedian of all time by Rolling Stone magazine a few years ago. Um, it all He was at Comedy Central's 100 Greatest Comedians. He was ranked number 23. I put him in the top 10, to be perfectly honest. He started out on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He's uh, won a Grammy for Best Comedy Album. He, uh, he's got a million specials. He won an Oscar for his short lived, for his short live action film, The Appointments of Dennis Jennings. 
He is. Uh, he he worked on Louis Louis C.K. show. Um, anyway, uh, what what can we say? This is this book Harold is amazing. We're going to talk all about it. Please enjoy my conversation with Stephen Wright. Uh, I'm on I'm on a Zoom call from Massachusetts to Los Angeles, which is a very different mentality uh, in the world. I would say uh, Stephen Wright is uh, a true New Englander, uh, a man who I think was very affected by Thoreau, Whitman, men that like to be creative in the woods. Is that fair to say? Only in the sense that I like the idea of what Thoreau did, that he went there to get away from what he thought was the madness at the time. I never really read. I've read just a little bit of both of them, but him, it was more of the idea of what he did. Yeah. Boiling, yeah. boiling everything down to the essence. Right, right. Um, you're, in your book... You have a new book, which is, uh, yeah, I, I read it this past weekend, could not put it down. It's called Harold. It's it's really, uh, it's just so laugh out loud funny. And at the same time, you go on this journey through the eyes of a seven-year-old boy that is very profound, and it's filled with a lot of philosophy and a lot of social commentary. And it's wonderful. Thanks for writing oh. it. Great. I'm glad you couldn't put it down. That's that's great. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I just figured I I figured, you know, let me read a chapter or two before I talk to him. And then my wife was like uh, she was she was just like, get off the couch. I'm like, no, this shit is I kept reading her quotes from it. There's like so many funny ideas. Like one of the ones I loved is that uh, the seven year old boy who is. He can't stop his thoughts. Let me just set it up for the listener. So basically, yeah. th I think this 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 kind of sums it up. He um, he felt the way his mind worked was that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny birds in his head, and each bird represented a single thought. There was also a very very small rectangle in the middle of his brain, like an empty window frame or a picture frame. The birds were much smaller than the frame. They were flying all around randomly in his mind, which was like an indoor sky. When one of these birds flew through the rectangle, whatever thought that bird represented, that's what Harold would think about. And it is just such a clean, interesting visual of how a brain works in a young boy. You know, I thought of that several years before I was working on the book and just in, in, in regards, just an analogy of uh, my own mind, like, like, you know, because it was just like a, you know, you think of things like the birds, you think of things out of the blue, you know, I mean, how tall is Bobby or, you know, you know, yeah. like just out of the blue. And I thought of that whole thing, well, all the tiny birds, maybe that's why, because your mind leaps around. So when I was, started writing Harold. I remembered that and I thought, oh yes, this should go right in here. And I think everyone's mind works like that. Yes, but how much do we allow the freedom of those thoughts to uh, to be in the now? I think you said at one point you said he lives in he lives in the now and uh, uh, many so many of us take those thoughts and push them aside and this What's beautiful about a child is that they honor each thought. Yeah, everything is is new to him. He's yeah. just going. He's just going with it. This whole yeah. experience of being alive. Did you? Uh, do you have nephews, or was there was there a boy that you kind of thought of as you were writing this, or is this just you as a boy? I have nephews, but there was nothing about involved with them except the very end, the very last page when he comes home and he, his mother says, how was school? And he says, good. That was from my nephews when they were like 
10 or 12, you know, I would hear that my, they lived about 20 minutes from me and I would, my sister would tell me what they did. Oh, they went to a boat show. They went to skiing in New Hampshire. Oh, they built an ice skating rink in the back. And they went, they went to see yeah. this guy play music. And I would go over there. I said, how was the thing? How was the boat show? How was the skate? How was it? How did you like that? How was it? Good. <laughs> You know, like, like a kid, just one word, not yeah. being a jerk, just right. good. But the but I wrote a story for Rolling Stone magazine in like '87, and it went in there, and it was called The Beach, and it was about it was a fairy tale about how the beach was invented, and I would read it like every five years because I liked it, and then the last time I read it, I thought I'd like to write another story because I really, you know, I'm just doing jokes, not complaining. I mean, just doing that. And then I thought, oh, I should write something else. So I started writing this and I don't know why it was Harold. I don't know why it, it was a, I think I like it as a boy because everything is new. And what I realized as I was going was that, you know, jokes are a narrow window of creativity, you know, a couple of, when I do, I mean, two or three sentences, and then they laugh out loud, hopefully. Very narrow thing. But I had stuff in my head that was more than that would go through that window. So, and I started writing about Harold, and then I realized early on that I was going to just put a funnel, like, onto the top of his head, and I was going to dump everything I think about life into his mind and have him think it, you know, he can't be thinking about 70% of what he, you know, a seven year old, but that was like, I got to gush this out through his head. Right. Right. And what's amazing is I've always thought about, is it possible to write a book where you are truly stream of consciousness, where you can capture the way a mind goes from thought to thought, because you think so much faster than you could ever write. And, and, uh, and I think this book comes closer to capturing that. I mean, you know, the beats kind of tried to do that, you know, Kerouac and Ginsburg, and they tried to capture that flow, but, uh, through the, through the mind of a child, what's interesting is how profound some of the things he talks about, like the, the, you know, the teacher's, you know, school is authoritarian and we live in a country that's not supposed to be authoritarian. And yet this is our earliest learning experience. Yes. And as so. adults, as a parent of two kids, I can remember my kids coming home and just saying, mom, this is crazy. I'm <laughs> in a chair for seven hours straight while one person talks and I can't answer. It's crazy. It is. It's like a little dictatorship. Yeah the opposite of what the country is supposed to be. And what's nice is that his relationship with the teacher, he loves her, but he also really resents her. And it's, you capture that kind of duality and how she, he feels about her. Yeah. I love the things that he says in his mind that he doesn't have the guts to really say to her. Yeah. You know, all wise ass shit. May I have your attention, please? Get your own attention. <laughs> and that, I love that line. <laughs> that came from walking in the airport. Oh, you know, we live in airports. And the announcement would come, may I have your attention, please? And one, one time I was walking and in my, my, in my mind, I said, get your own attention. So <laughs> when you work, <laughs> when you're working on the book, all these things that I never even wrote down, they would come back. And we're like, oh, oh, this can go, oh, this can go right in here. Yeah, right. And but I don't know how to write a story. So when I first started working on it, I showed it to a friend of mine a couple of pages, and he said, "This, this is this, this can't continue. There's no story <laughs> here." And I thought, oh well, he, he he's right. There's no story. And then I didn't work on it for many months. And then one day I thought all right, I don't know how to write a story. I'm just going to do it like this. I don't know how to do it the way of first, second, third story. So I'll just see what happens. I had a lot of fun writing it. 
It was no book deal. There was no one waiting for it. And I would just, my, my, I have a pretty good imagination, but when I drink coffee, it go, are you a coffee guy? Drinking it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that I thanked coffee in the acknowledgments? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> and this kid who's seven years old, he discovers it, and it made me think of Beavis and Butthead. Remember when Beavis drinks coffee and he starts no. going, I'm Don Colio. I have my uh -oh. in my bunghole. Oh, is uh, that why you said that? Yeah, yeah. The, oh. Yeah, because he was jacked up on coffee. So, yeah, the, I liked it. He got into these fever dreams when uh, the character, when he would drink coffee and he would have these epiphanies. Oh, oh I didn't know that. I, I, uh, my coffee is like a, to me, it's like a pretty powerful drug. Yeah. And, and so I would have like a two hour window where it was like, and I would just try to write during those two hours. And then when it wore off, I would stop. Well, that leads me to my next question, which is, do you think you have ADHD? Because that is actually what Ritalin does. The, you know, getting jacked up on coffee allows people with ADHD to actually focus. And the way this book is written, this kid clearly has ADHD. No, I don't have it. No. No, I definitely don't have it. See, what you are, when you read the book all at once... You are, there's years of those two hour things. Right. You know, like, so then when you, in a, in reading it all at once, it's like, what, what? But it was only like two hours. And even when I was going wild on the two hours, it was just that my, ima my imagination was heightened. Yeah. But I don't, I don't, I don't have that definitely. But I can yeah. see how you would think. I mean, how could you? How could you just following what he's thinking? It's right. like he definitely has that. He has that, and he's on speed. Yeah. But speed is supposed to make it slow down, right? I mean, the Ritalin. That's what's funny. That's it's sort of like a paradox: is that you're taking somebody who's kind of hyperactive and you're giving them a stimulant, but somehow that makes the brain work the same way the body is working and they kind of meet up and they're able to work together. Um, so I've been on it for, I've been on Ritalin for years and it oh, changed, really? changed my life. I, I wrote a book also and I couldn't, oh. I, 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 I had to stop writing because I couldn't do it. And then I got on Ritalin and I breezed through it. It was uh, oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's I mean, great. I'm not recommending it to everybody. It's not for everybody. And I think it gets misused a lot, but in the right case, uh, under what, what doctor's supervision, what is it's the called book? Dear Mrs. Fitzsimmons. And I was, uh, I was in my aunt's basement in the Bronx, and I found a shoebox, and it was filled with letters and bad reports that my mother had received about me my entire life, because uh, I was such a lunatic, and she thought they were funny, so she always saved them. And so it was Dear Mrs. Fitzsimmons, and I, I printed all the letters, and then I sort of wrote about what was going on in them. Wow, that's incredible. That's amazing. <laughs> that was like a gold mine. For you. Yes, yes. It was like that perspective of your own childhood. Well, it's very Irish, you know, to sort of like celebrate fighting authority, you know. Oh, is it? Oh God, yeah. I mean, come on, you're a Boston man. You've seen that rebelliousness that the Irish have. Yeah, I, I definitely. But I, I have that. I mean, it's all in the book. People yeah. have it. Sometimes you have it automatically, no matter where you grow up, because there's so many rules. Yeah. And then you realize, like your kids, when they came home from school, saying, "What is? This? There's so many rules." And then you're accepting. You're accepting elementary, junior high, and then, high, and then it's like, "Wait, wait a minute! Wait a minute!" Right, right. Oh dear! Like parking meters infuriate me. You get a, you know, you don't, you miss it twenty minutes in the ticket. How dare you? How yeah. dare you charge me to park? Who are you to yeah. charge me sixty bucks to park here? Right, like you, like you own this piece of the earth. I know the logistics of civilization and how the city works and how they really have to do that. But the gut feeling, like your kids, is like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. I remember Tingle used to have a bit about that. He's like, 
I pay a thousand dollars a month for my apartment. And if I'm late by, by a week, my landlord charges me an extra $50. If I park my car and I stay past the limit, they charge me 10,000 times the rent. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I never heard that one. Yeah. He's fantastic. Yeah. How's he doing? How is, have you seen him lately? I haven't seen him. I, I see him every couple of years, but I know he's doing shows all the time because I get the, the emails, uh, what he's doing a lot of, they're all political fundraiser mixed in with comedy stuff. He's still going strong. Yeah. Yeah. I get the emails too. Um, he's, uh, he's carved out an interesting career. You know, I like, I like when somebody really sticks to their guns and does yes. it their way, you know? What a character he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, speaking of characters, can we talk about you dedicated the book to uh, Bob Lazarus? Um, or you thanked him or you dedicated it to him? It was in the acknowledgments. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. And uh, I was I was good friends with him back in Boston. And uh, oh, I didn't know that. I know it was very sad. He died of leukemia about what, about 10 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. 2009. OK. Yeah. Um, so what are some of your great memories with Laz? Just, just laughing. I mean, he, he, he was, he's hilarious on stage and hanging out. It was just, I would say 90% laughing, you know, mixed in with some actual information. Yeah. He's one yeah. of my favorite people in my whole life. I mean, so when I had this book, here's this thing, this document of something. And then the acknowledgements, I, I put him in as a, the meaning of how much he means to me in my life. You know, yeah. it wasn't, had nothing really to do with the book, but it was just like nothing has ever really written down comedy, you know, an album or something. It goes up in the air, but here's this thing. And it was almost like out of respect for him. Right, right. Yeah. Did you laugh with him constantly? Oh, yeah. Well, I used to, well, I used to live next door to uh, Mike Donovan. And he used to oh, hang out with one Donovan of my all-time favorite guys. And I was at Donovan's one night, and uh, we were all smoking pot. Uh, those guys like to smoke pot. And uh, and then Mike disappeared. And this is when computers were pretty new. Like, not a lot of people had computers. This would have been in, like, 1988 or something. And so uh, he disappears, and me and Bob are sitting there. And, you know, Donovan used to make these compilation tapes of Red Sox clips on VHS tapes. And they would be these really like it was like a mystery. There would be a clip of uh, a home run. You know, you'd see Wade, you'd see, or you'd see Wade Boggs make a great play. And then there would be just seven pitches in a row. That, that would be the clip. And then, the, and then there'd be another action clip. And, and you were trying to get inside his mind. And so me and Laz are just sitting there watching these clips, trying to figure out Donovan's mind. And after like a half an hour, I was like, where the fuck is Mike? And so I go, I'm going to go look for him. So I go in the bedroom where the computer was and Donovan was hiding in the closet. And I looked at the computer and just like in The Shining, where there was a, one line written over and over again, I said, yeah, yeah. I have to kill my friends, Bob and Greg. <laughs> and over again, scrolling down the computer. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. And he knew eventually you would go in there. Oh my God. Did and you he, both go in at once and see? No, it? I I went in and then I called in Bob and then he saw it and Donovan kept quiet until we were both in the room. <laughs> I never heard that story. That's yeah. just tremendous. That's yeah. tremendous. Yeah. He's one of my all time favorite people too, Mike Donovan. What a unique guy. Uh, person and he's he's written like 20 books history books i have one of his books that he wrote about the movies oh yeah and yeah it's it, you know it's his perspective on this thing and he points out things that you don't really hear in regular reviews and uh and also on stage one of my all-time favorites yeah, he is one of the great joke constructionists of all time. I learned so much from watching Mike Donovan write a joke, just boiling it down, not a single word that doesn't belong in that joke. It's just perfect. Exactly. And yeah. a presence, an interesting presence to him. Yeah. He, he walks on the stage, 
you you like him but there's a whole unique vibe like this guy is not your average guy you yeah. know you can tell so then before he's even while he's speaking this his presence and what he's saying is like it's just excellent he's the ultimate boston wise ass just like <laughs> yes. the toll booth, the toll booth thing. Do you have any change? Uh -oh. That's not the question. <laughs> the question is, do you have change? That's your yeah. job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> oh God. Um, and then, uh, all right. So let's get back to this book. Cause I have so many questions about it. Um, so it, it was, uh, there's a lot of talk about death and God, and which are heavy thoughts for you would think you would think, God, that's that's a heavy thought for a seven year old. But like talk to a seven year old, especially a kid who's been exposed to religion and who's been told that when you die, you're going to go to heaven or hell or that God is making everything happen. And then those are some very existential things that a kid is processing. So. Were you raised religious and did you have like an experience leaving that or what's your background? I was raised Catholic and I still like will go on holidays, Easter and Christmas. And my mind is like divided in half. Like I believe all of that. And then the other half of me is like a scientist. And I'm fine with having both things going at once. So that's why every time he mentions God, if there is a God, God, if there yeah. is a God, you know, yeah. it keeps happening all the way right. through. But I wasn't really thinking what would a kid think, really. That's an interesting thing about this. Because for years, you know, jokes are from noticing. And that all my stuff is noticing. You know, like a kid notices everything. You have mm -hmm. kids, so you, they just know but I would notice something and I would think, oh, that could be, just, but I get to comment on it with the words of an adult, yeah. you know? So I have the uh, observation of a child, but I can send it out with the words of an adult. So the kid, I mean, he, he's seven, but there's no way. I wasn't thinking, well, will a seven year old think this? Well, very early on, I was like, I don't give a shit if a seven year old would think this. Yeah. I don't care. I don't right. care. I'm having fun. And like it takes place in the 60s, like 63, but then they'll, you know, say uh, Helter Skelter, which didn't come out till 68. You know, and it's like, I don't care. I'm going to round off the decade. Yeah. Right, right, right. You know, so it was very uh, freeing thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what works about the book is that it is, um, it, it it's like a it's a stew of thoughts and ideas, and you know you say there's no story, but there's vignettes that really work that have beginning, middle, and ends to them that are, oh, yeah. yes. you know, sci-fi and uh, and super deep, like him just sitting in a classroom and the thoughts that happen. And think about how many thoughts a kid has while he's trapped in that chair for seven <laughs> hours a day. You're listening about what, 20% of the time to the teacher? Yes. You're going in and out, in and out. Like it says he, he would pay attention, like someone who came in to pick his mail up. You know, he came in like, <laughs> you go in and out. I mean, yeah. even as an adult, you would have to, okay, now you can focus. As an adult, you could try to stay on maybe 70 percent on to you know but then you hit the kid's brain is like no no way yeah yeah so you kind of still have a kid's brain that's the thing about you i mean not that i've spent that much time with you but we've hung out a number of times and it's been it's always i always walk away from it going like wow that guy is present he is in the now and i, I and it's it's almost like you're a buddhist or something <laughs> and 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 uh and they so that's what gets captured in the book and i think that's what's that's what makes it really seem like a seven-year-old is you are like a seven-year-old yeah the heightened heightened awareness heightened i don't know why i'm like that but it's like just i don't know it's just part of my character to be aware of uh you know, my surroundings, I'll be somewhere and there'll be something happening and I'll take a picture of not what's happening. Like there's something behind what's happening. You right, know, you probably right. do. It's like this stuff 
all over the place. Yeah. Right. The, the world is like mosaic painting. I've said this before, you know, a giant mosaic painting of little tiny fragments makes up the world and, and you know, noticing some of them, it's just some, oh, oh, some of them, you know, and then sometimes these pieces can be put together. They would never really be put together, but with words, they could be put together. Right. And, but I'm not thinking this when I'm, I'm explaining this, but I'm just joking. I'm just, oh, oh, that's, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. you see something, you're not breaking it down. It's like, right. oh, that could mean this. Oh. Right, 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 <laughs> right. I know. And I think the world wants us to look at one image. You know, we, they want, we, everybody has a news feed and they get fed the same 12 stories every day. And then you see, so you bump into somebody and you go, hey, and you reconfirm that you got that same data. Oh, you saw that the, the, King Charles got coronated and he couldn't get the Spice Girls to sing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that, too. And, and you both confirm, yeah, we're, we're on the same wavelength. We're, we're drawing from the same well. But it's the guy that's looking outside the well and, and looking around at what, what else is going on. Well, that's funny you say that about confirming that you both saw the same piece of information because about 25 years ago, that came into my mind when I was, I met a friend of mine and I knew he's, you know, I were friends for years, but I knew he was talking about the Red Sox, something had happened. And then, and I heard what had happened and I, I don't know, it clicked, to, it clicked to me for some reason that he was almost like a, we were radio stations made out of meat that was sig <laughs> signal. <laughs> <laughs> the signal was sent. The signal was sent, but not like yeah. a real radio. We can walk yeah. out into the yard and say, you know, a radio is just there. But yeah, because he was relaying. He was relaying yeah. to me what I had been relayed to my right. already, like you just described. Right, right, and it's not necessarily processed or editorialized. It's just, it's just relaying it. It's just passing it on, like the telephone game. And uh, but it kind of you kind of talk about this a thing I think about also, which is like how we're I forgot how you said it, but we're two different people because you know there's the person, and then it's like, all right, well, then who am I talking to if I'm having these thoughts? And I, I've always been obsessed with that, like oh. who's the other person that's in there that I'm talking to and is answering me. And is correcting me and is trying to get me to behave a certain way. Yes. Uh, when he says he's plural, considers himself plural. Right. He right. That's himself right. Plural. Because, because I know it's, you're just one, but it's, uh, it occurred to me years ago, like you, you're having, you're having little meetings in your head. Yeah. You know, you, you think of something and then a, a, a slightly different part of you is, well, I don't know what I think about that. And, you know, you're having little, dis even though it, I guess it's just called thinking, but because it seems like this too, you're bouncing it off yourself, which right, means right. like you have two versions of the self. You have the guy who thought of it and the guy who reacted to it, even though it's really the same guy. Right. But for some reason, it was, I thought, oh, that's almost like there's a little, a little team in your head. Yeah. Yeah. You thought that too? Yeah. I've, I've been obsessed with that. I've always thought oh. that like, I, and I thought that maybe part of it was, you know, grow, I grew up very Catholic also. And I always thought, well, maybe that's like my conscience. Maybe, maybe God lives in my head as some kind of a conscience. And, and I need to um, bounce things off of that person or get in agreement with that person. And I feel like I never will. Um, <laughs> you know, like, what if you did? What if you suddenly were in total agreement with that other voice? Think about what your life would be like. It would just, I think you would, I don't know. What, what would you be like if you didn't have that other voice? You, I think you would, you would be like, if you had been, you would be in a type of jail, like, you, well, like had a lobotomy, like Jack Nicholson and Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. If you, you they just stripped you, All right. and you just uh, okay, okay. But that double thing with you and the religion is you, you as a guy, you as a person, and then you're trying to accept this wild thing that they're telling you. It, you know, it, it, 
<laughs> it's fascinating. Yeah. The world the world is like chaos. It's total chaos. And then they made so many rules to kind of make sense of it, which is kind of good, really. Like, yeah. okay, because otherwise it's, you know, the whole religion thing. And, and but as a kid, I, I don't know. I, I, it's just, uh, if you didn't have any of that, if you just agreed, you would just be like a boring slug, don't you think? You'd just be like, well, yeah, and I think that maybe self-actualization is getting those two things to get somewhat close because the opposite of that is a pure hypocrite. Like when you think about these Christian evangelists that get oh, caught yeah. with young boys and stuff, you go, <laughs> all right, well, that guy's voices are, they're not communicating at all. They're, one voice has no control over the other one at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Oh, my God. So, I mean, what would Freud say? He, you know, he talked about the id and the superego and, and, you know, I think maybe that's, that has something to do with this. You know, the superego is always trying to control the id. The id is just wild impulses, but that's more behavior than thought. Yeah, there's a lot going on in everyone's head. And little tiny tornadoes. You know when the tornado goes and the papers are flying around from the t tornadoes? Like, yeah, yeah. That's their, everyone's head. Everyone's yeah. head. I right. see a guy walking into Marshalls. It, you know, he, he all we know is he's walking into Marshalls. But he's thinking, oh, my God, I got to go meet here in two hours. I had that argument I had last night. Oh, my God, why am I in here? Oh, yeah, sandals. Oh, I got to get gas on the way home. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and Marshalls is trying to get his attention. They got sale signs up. They got oh, yeah. the men's department over here. They're like, hey, we're here. Look yes, at us. Yes. Go down here and buy this. <laughs> stop thinking care. about your gas yeah, yeah. Right. stop thinking give us your money yeah right. it'll distract you during the time of the purchase you'll be <laughs> thinking of something else you should yeah. almost pay us triple for the actual thing and because you got to rest from your own head <laughs> well that's i mean that's what drugs are too i mean drinking and drugs are just a way of Blowing down the voices. I mean, maybe for some people it makes the voices worse, but I think a lot of people are just trying to numb the thoughts a little bit. Just it's slow it. Just slow it down. Just slow it down. And and mm -hmm. be. And, you know, I do this breathing thing of meditating five in five, and you know, I can do it randomly. I'll do it just randomly, and it and it work. It works every time. To like, okay, I'm just driving the car right now. That's what yeah. I'm doing. It brings you right back do you know mike armstrong my friend yeah. mike yeah yeah well, well when we drove across the united states in 1982 we had this piece of shit subaru station wagon and it broke down in pennsylvania so now we had six hours of like wondering if the guy's going to be able to fix it how much is it going to cost how much so we were focused on this thing and, and then later and even to, that's 1982 we, we refer to that as the subaru theory which is when something took your mind so much that you didn't have time for that tornado. Yeah, we were yeah. just focused. Is the guy going to fix this? Well, right. you know. So right. in a way, it stopped everything uh -huh. for the, that for that time period. Right, right. Yeah, the Subaru. I mean, it's uh, it's I guess why we watch sports too. When you get really engrossed in a game, that's exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. I had the basketball on the other night and, and it wasn't even the Celtics and I'm just watching it and it, with the, I had the sound off and I'm watching it because I didn't want to hear any more of what's happening in the world. Yeah. I wanted to say, oh, look at this. How did he do that? Yeah. Because especially nowadays, the amount of information Mm -hmm. You know, in the in the movies when they would open a hydrant up in New York in the summer, like in the yeah. '50s, so the kids could run around in the water like that gush. Yeah, that the that's what the news is now. And rather right. than water, it's it's news. Yeah, and you got to like step out of it, yeah. walk away. Yeah, right. And uh, reading the book, 
uh, cause I've always been a big reader and I always thought that that was like my meditation because when you get lost in, in a book, oh my God, how great do you feel when you sit down and read for two hours on a Saturday, you feel totally relaxed. Your mind is centered. Um, and you know, TV is the opposite. You watch TV and they're assaulting you with quick, quick cuts, this scene, that scene, this character, this subplot. And you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's junk food. And when it's over, you feel depleted when you read. Yes, you it's, feel it's exhausting. Filled. Yeah. It's Cause your inner, inner wiring is trying to pay attention to some degree. Cause that's how you're wired and it's, you're exhausted, but yet reading a book, I'm reading this book now. And it's like, it's like, Oh, and then reading a book, there's no sound. And I go through phases recently where I'll just have nothing on. No, uh, I don't mean clothes. I mean, like <laughs> the radio, the TV, I'll be driving with nothing. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, oh, but the book is interesting because you get to be entertained in your mind and it's quiet. Yeah. And the book is like gears, like this, the way you're thinking is different than when you watch television. It's a very calming experience. Yeah, because you can read and pause and ruminate on a thought if you want for a second. You know, you can pull out of it and uh, and you can imagine your own scenarios and the people and you're kind of, it's kind of collaborative. I mean, reading a book is somebody giving you almost the outline, but then you're coloring it in yourself as you read. Yeah. Um, you're creating, you're, you're drawing it in your head. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a book I think you should read if you get a chance it's long, but it's worth it. Uh, you know, Charlie Kaufman, the director. Yes. Um, he wrote a book called ant kind and, uh, it, it reminded me of your book a lot. It's in, in the, in the way that it, uh, just digresses and goes into little, uh, you know, uh, stream of consciousness stuff, yeah. but, but he's brilliant. And, uh, it's a great book. Maybe I'll send it to you. Yes, he is brilliant. And ants like an ant to me. Yeah. Ants kind. Yeah. I would love to read that. Yes. I would love for you to send me that. All right. I'm going to send you that. I'll have to get your address. All right. Um, and then, uh, wait, there's some other notes I wanted to get to, uh, there's just so many funny lines. Uh, oh, you you really shit on uh, L.A. What was it? You said that God came down and he shit out the malls. No, almost. All right. They're they're on the moon with Carl Sagan, and he's talking about spaceships. And then the girl says, "Do they ever fly over the Earth?" Yes, they do. Spaceships fly over the Earth, but people don't see them. They only see the result of them. What are the results of them? malls? They they can't fly over the earth and they shit out and malls are the result. <laughs> Is that the biggest thing that they ever shit out? No, no. Years ago, <laughs> one flew over and shit out the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> because when I used to live there, and a lot of it is beautiful, but when I think of Los Angeles, I think of Lincoln Boulevard from the airport to Santa Monica. You That's know where that? I live. <laughs> you, I live in Venice, right off Lincoln. <laughs> do, do you, do you, I mean, I know even in Boston, there's alleys and stuff, but yeah. I don't, that's, I don't think of Malibu. I don't think of the mountains or the yeah. beach. I think of that street over and over 12 years. Of, and then that street is everywhere. Like in the Flintstones, I noticed when I was a kid watching the Flintstones that they'd be walking through the house and the background would just repeat. Where yeah, right, would, right, right. It would be the same window and yeah. plant, same window and plant. Same. And that's what else me LA is like that, except with Lincoln Boulevard. Is they're they're all they're all over the it's just repeated. Yeah, yeah. Mini mall. <laughs> so yeah. You live you yeah, live that's where I live. That's where I live. That's where I live. Scenario and you live right near there. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> but in my defense, in my defense, 
please, uh, we, please. We, live, we live about halfway between Lincoln and the beach. So we're in like, okay. Yes. That's place. a neighborhood, a nice neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. The house I, was I was at that house? That house? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. Yeah, very yeah, calm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Yes. Yeah. See, the thing is, I, I don't think of that. Yeah. The other part is more made an impact. But that's the thing about L.A. It's the same thing with Ventura Boulevard in the Valley. It's just like you said, this strip mall has a Chipotle and a gas station and a massage place that gives happy endings. And then 100 yards up, it's the exact same three places. But then if you take a right and you go into like Toluca Lake, like, did you ever go to Kevin Meany's house when you were yes, here? Yes, yes, beautiful. Wasn't area. that a great little house? Yes, yeah. And and his neighborhood was like paradise. It was like out of a movie set. But you know, you go a couple blocks over and you're on Ventura. He was amazing. I missed yeah. it. Uh, he was just total unique. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, when he I was. Him, when I think of him, it just makes me smile. I can see his twinkle in his eye. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he was uh, he was in my wedding party. He was like my oh, really? uh, he was like my mentor in comedy. He he took care of me for 20 years. And uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he actually he. Well, my father belonged to a golf club. We grew up just outside of New York in New York City. And uh, he was a uh, he my father belonged to a golf club. And Kevin was the pot scrubber. He was a dishwasher at the uh, at the golf club. And then he became a waiter. And he used to do these crazy routines at the table. He would do the, he would go, he'd be like, would anybody like some dessert? Good news. The cheesecake boat just got here. Cheesecake boats are coming. And he would do a song and dance in the middle of a, in the middle of a country club dining room. And he had on his, you know, the bow tie was from those days because he used to dress with a bow tie and a dinner jacket when he was a waiter. When he was a waiter. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. So then when he wanted to be a stand up comedian, my father was a big radio guy in New York. And my father got him on stage at Catch a Rising Star because he knew the owner. That was his first time on stage. And then many years later, my father told me, uh, you remember that waiter, Kevin from Knollwood? And I go, yeah, the really funny waiter. He goes, well, he's a big comedian now. He just did the Tonight Show a few times and he's got an HBO special. So I went and I saw him at Catch a Rising Star in Cambridge. And without a doubt, I have never seen a comedian destroy a crowd the way he did that night. It was 100% of the people were doubled over holding their stomachs. I've never seen anything like that before or since. Because when you watch him, you would laugh out loud. Yeah. I mean, you can watch a comedian and think, oh, that's very interesting. That's really funny. But you're not, at least comedians, you're not really laughing out loud. Yeah. But right. you know, you're, intellectually, you know that that's funny. But yeah. he had both both things going. Right. Right. Yeah. And And he gave, he really cared about giving a good show. He was old school. He was an entertainer. And and so so then he moved out to L.A. and he met a woman and they started dating and he called me and he goes, uh, guess who I'm dating? And it was my next door neighbor who used to babysit us, Marianne. So they hooked up in L.A. and they ended up getting married and having a kid. And uh, <laughs> it's the craziest coincidence. <laughs> So you're he's waiting on your table at the country club, and, and then years later he's he's advising you on comedy. Yeah, I mean that that's a that's a book right there. Yeah, I know, I know, and uh, I'm still close with his wife and his daughter, and uh, I just talked to them a couple of days ago. Um, but yeah, you talk about somebody who leaves a hole in your life. I mean, there's people that die, and you know, and it's like probably you with Bob Lazarus, and there's just People you really do like literally think of every day. Yes. Like Barry Crimmins, Barry yeah. Crimmins. You know, he, I, I have the book for Barry Crimmins in the beginning. It says for him and uh, right. Peter LaSalle. I mean, that's yeah. a giant, like, like it's not real. Yeah. No party thinks, it's, knows it's real. Yeah. And I'm really glad Bobcat has taken such an interest in keeping his legacy alive, you know, with the documentary. And I guess he's, I think he wrote a feature also that they're trying to get made. Yes, right I think now. he did. 
he I believe he did also. Yes, that's amazing. That documentary was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Um, I remember how he used to be in the back at Catch a Rising Star in Cambridge when I first started, and he used to walk back and forth by the bar. And if you were on stage and you did something hacky, he would actually yell out, "That's Ke- that's Steve Sweeney's joke." All right, all right. <laughs> He, he was so scary back then. Yeah, if you didn't if you didn't know him and you were a younger guy, I heard he was overwhelming to people. Yeah. And then and then I got to know him as I got older and he and I realized he was just a teddy bear, you know, just had had very strong opinions on things. One time we were gonna go out after the show from the ding ho and uh I said uh that's he said, let's go somewhere. All right. And I said, I, I, have, I have a good amount of money. And, and he said, well, I have hardly any money. And we both had $30. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> So he, so who bought? I don't remember. It was yeah. just the perspective of that the same so amount. Funny. Oh, I love that. Um, all right. So here's the other thing I want to ask you about. You talk a lot about the Lakota Indians, and uh, where, is that something you've had an interest in for a while? Um, you can talk about a lot of their kind of philosophies and traditions. I been interested in that for years not deeply but the idea that there was they were called the Sioux and Lakota they had two names that name I think the Sioux was what the white man called them but uh and then I was in in Boston Logan Airport about seven years ago and I was walking around a bookstore and in the bookstore in the airport and there was a book called in the heart of everything and it was about Red Cloud, the head chief of the Lakota Nation. And I bought that book and I, I was just like, just fascinated because you know, I, I still think of like, what was this like before all this shit, you know, when it was real, the beauty right. that still seeps into my uh consciousness. So then like writing the book, it just, it just seeped in. You know, it's just, and then I had to think, well, why does the grandfather know this Lakota? Oh, because when they bombed Pearl Harbor, then they made uh, the Air Force Base in South Dakota. I can't remember the name of Ellsworth. So uh-huh. he, the grandfather had him be surveying there. Right. And then he meets, meets them. So then he can have Lakota uh, comments. One thing I like about it is when uh, the grandfather says that the Lakota th- when they knew of the idea of a planetarium, they thought only the white man would build an indoor sky and charge money to look at. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And then there's another part where the uh, the Dakotas, wait, I think I wrote it down. Oh, yeah. Here, let me read this. The Lakota were on horseback and had recently eaten some peyote. They were looking at the merry-go-round and laughing so hard they almost pissed themselves and fell off their horses. The three of them were yelling at each other in Lakota while they were screaming laughing. The grandfather could only remember one thing they were saying, which was no wakan tanka, no wakan tanka, meaning godless. Godless. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you see that in your head? Yes. You watch it? Yes. Yes. Just just horses with whole with poles run through them, going in circles. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yes. Yeah. And then uh and then I guess uh Carl Sagan is bringing uh a spaceship full of the uh the horses. Merry go round. Merry go round to God if if there is a God. Coffee. That was from coffee. Yeah. Yeah. That because was... Carl, Carl Sagan is in my mind too. Like that's an unbelievable how he 
would communicate all that stuff to regular people, you know, it was like, just like during the writing of it, these things would just float up like something in a lake would just float up. Yeah. And then they would go right in. Yeah. Um, and I, there was, there, there was another thing that I liked. Oh, the, um, the subway, this thing I really visualized as somebody who lived in New York for a lot of years is that he imagined what if, they had installed a roller coaster instead of the subway system in New York City. And that that to me is like that would be an amazing short film. If you could like <laughs> animate that, that would be amazing. Thank you. That was in my head from years ago also, because the because another thing of like combining two realities, the beginning of a roller coaster is flat. It's just the train on the tracks, right? Just right. like it, just like it is on the subway. So in the story, he imagines if uh, uh, they accidentally hired a roller coaster company instead of the actual, and then when they leave the station, then it's a whole other thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so great, and they don't know, and they don't know it when they get on the train, no. and then all of a sudden they're they're going in a loop to loop, going like I'm just trying to get to Queens here. What the hell is going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um has has gavin read this yet because you know don gavin's a huge reader have you sent him a copy no i haven't uh i have to thank you i haven't talked to him in a couple of months i didn't know he was a big reader I, I, oh my I god he reads like to. he reads like four books a week he's, a, he's obsessed. Someone, someone someone is at my door how can we stop this yeah go ahead sure it was the state police, but I talked them out of it. <laughs> what did you, what did you tell them? The guy, guy just looks like me. It's not me. I said, no way. <laughs> and he left. <laughs> I had this cop pull me over on my, on my birthday. And oh. uh, somebody had called me to wish me a happy birthday while I was in my car. And you know how sometimes when you answer your phone, it goes to your, phone instead of your car's intercom and then you're trying to yeah. so i was trying yeah. to get it to go to my car and the cop saw me and he pulled me over and he goes it was, it was like a boston cop he had that attitude and he goes uh and so the siren goes off and i start pointing at myself like i didn't know that i had done anything and then he goes uh yeah that's you turn the car to the right there you go pull it over and then he comes up and he and I figured this guy was such a douche. I wasn't even going to argue the ticket. So he comes up and he writes the ticket, and then he come and then he hands it to me. And I go, "Aren't you forgetting something?" And I say, "What?" I go, "To wish me a happy birthday." And then he goes, "Hold on a second. I didn't write the ticket. My partner did." And so he walks back to the car, and then he comes back and he goes, "Here's what you're going to do. You're going to mail in that you're arguing the ticket, and it's going to go away. Happy birthday." That's like, fantastic. Like that never did, happens. Did he see your license? Did he see your birthday on your license? No, he didn't. Not until I said, wish me a happy birthday. Oh. And, he, and then he went back and saw it. Yeah. That's cool. That is very cool. All right. So listen, before we go, uh, I always do a segment with my guests. It's called Fastballs with Fitz. I'm going to ask you a few questions that I ask all of my comedian guests. Um, what is the hackiest bit that you've ever done. Oh, I was just telling uh, Michael O'Brien yesterday. I had this when, when I started, I had some things that weren't one line or surreal things. And I had this thing about a gay dog that barked with a lisp. <laughs> now I would be arrested for that. <laughs> Now that doorbell would really be the state police. That's right. We heard we heard that soon. Step out of the car. Step out of the house. Right? It was just a made up thing. Well, the jail is real. That's dogophobia. Yeah. That's good. Um have you ever not finished a set? That's it. That's the question. Have you ever not finished a set while on? Yeah, in, in, a, in a place called. Uh, it was in the Lemonster. It was. Uh, 
I know the name. I can't think of it. It was like in 82, 81. And it was when comedy was everywhere, even in places that weren't comedy clubs. And this Scampies. No, that was in uh, Worcester. It was, anyway, there was a place where they had comedy one night a week, but it was a disco with a music and a floor. Ah. But but they didn't. The thing is that everything's going, going. And then the music stops. The ball stops spinning and a guy brings a microphone out onto the dance floor. The thing and I said to people, comedian friends for years after this, it, the audience should know there's going to be a show. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the basic. Yeah, <laughs> it shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that was. The, I know it was ten minutes, and I just left. <laughs> and they were so happy that you left. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So there was no stage. You weren't like elevated over the crowd. You were just standing on the dance no, floor. On the dance floor, bring the mic out. Oh. I didn't see, maybe there was a little sign, with, you know, paper things stuck to something. Yeah. I knew that 70% of the people had no idea why it was. The oh, wow. That sounds like a Paul Barkley or a Billy Downs gig right there. I don't remember. It could have been. Yeah. Um, here's one. Uh, finish this sentence. There are two types of people in the world. Go. I know three of them. <laughs> See, that sounds like it makes sense, but it doesn't. It, doesn't. <laughs> it negates the whole idea that there's two types of people in the world. Perfect. Um, all right. So listen. Stephen, you've been very generous with your time as you always are. It's just it's just an honor to talk to you. I think you're one of the greatest that's ever done it. And this book is right up there with some of the best specials you've done or whatever. I highly recommend people check it out. Um, it's available. Is it available yet, Harold? They can pre-order it, but it comes out May 16th next week. Where should they pre-order it? On Amazon or Simon right. & Schuster. Uh, okay. Good. Thanks for having me. I really love talking to you. I love uh, analyzing and uh, breaking it all down. It's always an enjoyment to speak to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for the compliments. I'm so glad that you, that you like the book. It means a lot to me. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, thanks for writing it. It's a, it's a gift. People are going to love it. Um, all right, and I'll catch up to you soon. All right. Thanks All right. a lot. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Stephen. Bye.